water right now, and uh, the whole issue of supply in regards to water, that uh, it allows AMSC to actually look at that purpose. Uh, AMSC is uh, a board of governors of seven uh, elected officials from AUMA, uh, which is, uh, is kind of run by a co-op style, uh, and four independent directors, which are recruited uh, for their expertise, whether it's legal expertise, financial, energy, insurance, and they're brought inside uh, the governors of the board. So, is the one shareholder of AMSC is in the So that's kind of how the money kind of flows. Uh, but first of all, is to pay for that expertise. Uh, the benefit that's not money is being able to have expertise at, inside the AOA staff that understand that energy so that when AOA is advocating on an energy issue, they have access to people like Brian who understand that whole business. So that's where the big plus go back to. Councilor Foster's question. Just, there, is, there is a big plus to me. Councilor Foster, you have one more? Thanks, Mayor Christie. So, just so that I think that we all feel that there is a benefit to the municipality, if we were to take and give you, have we signed the agreement, we now give you, say, the last six months of our of our records and you would make a comparison and, and provide us with a six month history of what it would have been if we would have been under your auspices to see that we actually are benefiting. Is that is that a possibility or absolutely um, you you hit the process on, on but we actually take a year's worth of data off. And uh, so the first step in the process so if a participant is currently in our program, we have all that data. Uh, industry rules require, if, if we don't have that data, there's an industry process and it's, um, it's actually in, 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 the, in regulation. We have to do what they call a, a, low, a historical, historical use request. So we'll get your permission. The respective wire service providers and gas providers will release their data. We take that data and start to profile it and understand what your usage is for that whole calendar year. And we further work with you to say, well, if you sign on for two, three, four years, you have any major projects that are coming on board. Year five, you may have a uh, new town building coming into effect, and we'll try and take that all into consideration. And uh, and then, again, come back with those product recommendations. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. You touched on terms just now. What type of term or what, what type of contract length of contract can can we enter into and uh, to try to stabilize our, our pricing on energy? So, um, as mentioned, we're trying to adopt a true hedging approach. Uh, when you commit to the program, uh, there's two things that our program has changed a little bit that I probably didn't touch on in a little now, is that you commit to five years. Uh, so you're committing to the program for five years, but you can look at your hedge for a period of two years. So if you feel only comfortable going for the two-year period, uh, you can do so, and we'll continue to work with you on those future years. Or if we see a, ma a major movement in the market that causes you to make, may make a decision quicker or later, uh, we'll try and get you that information. The other thing that we've enhanced our program to do, when you take a look at that very first chart that I did, we've always had a five-year program and a five-year contract. Essentially what that did was on January, if we were to stay with that same model, Essentially, what would happen on January 2nd, we would not have a five-year product. We would have a four-year, 364-day, whatever the, 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 the period. So what we try to do in our new program is reflect and look forward into market prices on a future basis. So we've introduced a 10-year product that we're looking at. So we're looking at products on a 10-year basis. And that's largely due to some of the things that we've seen in terms of what's happening to coal, and all these other market influences that may say, you know what, we went into, we bought your five-year contract, but we see a really good price in 2019. We can now act on that on your behalf. So again, providing value to the municipality in terms of budget certainty, predictability, etc. And if the price is right, we can go for it. Thank you. So like it says here, and I don't know what number slide it is, it's page five of eight. Um, 
Athena's energy procurement is pretty simple stuff. We have to hire uh, consultants to go through that for us. Um, if we hire a consultant to do that, uh, we get our price on energy plus the fee is tacked on, however it is, up from the consultant. And it says here, MSC negates the need for in-house or costly contracted energy procurement specialists. Correct. So you do not charge us for things like legal fees and the RFP process and that type of thing. Is that correct? Right? Absolutely. There, those, those come free of cost. Uh, we hire KPMG to monitor our process from start to finish. Uh, so typically what you see in the, in the industry is a two-step process. The first step being a general call-out to interested providers. Uh, we do a short list at that time. Uh, so that process has been monitored by KPMG. Uh, when we decide to go to market based on prices, um, we send out our second RFP. All responses are completely directed to KPMG. We are totally hands off. We are not influencing that process whatsoever. And with KPMG in the room, all bids are open at the same time, and we follow the uh, approved process and do all the due diligence on behalf of the municipality. Super. Thank you. So, you have a court? Did you have a question? Thank you, uh, Mayor Christie. Uh, thanks, Brian. In terms of um, adding new sites or having additional power requirements, can that be added to, without penalty uh, to the contract? Absolutely. They can be added, deleted at any time. Uh, of course, when, when deleted, um, you know, you just can't get rid of the energy. We try to spread that across your, your, your the rest of your portfolio. Uh, any excess, as mentioned, uh, you're not stranded with. It is sold back uh, at pool price and credited on the appropriate utility bill for that billing period. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Foster, you had your time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. You bet. Thank you. Have a great evening, and thank you for writing down. In light of time, we have a public hearing uh, in eight minutes. We look at sure. Let's look at uh, Spray Park and Tender Landing Landscapes. Engineer uh, Jordan Thompson will come up. And Take over the floor. You heard you got my game. Yeah. Thanks, Jordan. The floor is yours. Okay, so thank you, Mayor Christie. Uh, council before you is a uh, recommendation from administration uh, regarding Henner's Park Recreation Area and the Spray Park Landscaping uh, Tender Project. Um, in the summer, we uh, put out on Facebook a, a bit of a public consultation process that included uh, two concepts of the spray park and uh, received their feedback, or received their comments and, um, and uh, their votes. We also had a, uh, a display here at City Hall, at the Farmer's Market, and at the pool in which the public could see the two different concepts and uh, vote and offer comments on which ones uh, they preferred. So we took those comments. We uh, uh, and took those votes and found that the, the bubble fund concept that was online was the preferred concept. Uh, so that in turn was refined a bit. We uh, removed some of the uh, additional concrete work that was uh, proposed in, the, in that concept and, and replaced it with more green space. But other than that, the, uh, the uh, things that were most enjoyed with the concept were the green space and the colors, and those uh, two are retained in the final design. So recently we just closed the tender um, based on that final concept and uh, the bids did come in under our budget and so council or administration is recommending council uh, enter your contract with the Queen uh, Playgrounds for the work. All right, thank you. Council, questions? Councilor Connick. Thank you, Mary Christie. Just refresh my memory, what are we undertaking at Henner's? Is it that uh, observation deck primarily? Is that the... In this scope of work, the K 
council committed to back in, I think it was May last year, to at least $25,000 of improvements then. And so we had Lombard look at the area and provide a number of uh, concepts of uh, what could be done there. And we have four concepts on the books now, but each one of those concepts did include some safety improvements. And so what they include there specifically are, there's a couple embankments adjacent to the water to edge. We're gonna put some uh, safety railing, um, as well as a, uh, a trap just have to go up there. So it's just some, some fairly basic things this year. Councillor Christie, then Councillor Foster, and Councillor Tate. Uh, George, I'm just curious, so what all is there left after this landscaping uh, portion of the project for the, the uh, arena area? Well, what, what is there left to be done there? Like this is, does this include the fencing and all that stuff? Oh yes, yeah, this includes a perimeter fence, um, all the sod, um, the trees, the bushes, uh, the installation of those shade elements, uh, the staining of the concrete, and so everything you see there is, is all that we were planning to do for that spray park area. Okay, so there's, 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 there's nothing else after this event to do the spray park area that's, that's completed? This, yeah, that's all the planned for this. Thank you. Councillor Foster, then Councillor Kite. Thanks, Mayor Christine. Jordan, just my only question is uh, McQueen Playground installations, uh, are you satisfied with their background? Do, we, do what they have given you a, a history uh, when they took the bid? Oh, uh, they provided a, uh, a bid bond and a performance bond with the work. And so certainly if there's any issues with the work, uh, that's something that you have to draw on. Thank you. Councilor Kate. Thank you, Mayor Christy. John and I was um, uh, very pleased to see the options uh, for the spray park on Facebook because that generated a lot of discussion, at least on my Facebook page. And uh, several of my friends and young parents were asking me, what is this and what is that? And so it was great to see that uh, there was interest and people were engaged. Um, having said that, I would like to make the motion that the city enter into a contract for the Henry's Park and Spray Park Landscaping Improvements with McQueen Playground Installations, Inc. at a cost of $116,699 plus GST. Thank you. Councilor Just one quick question. Uh, there is presently awnings located on the building. Is that intended to, to remain to provide some additional uh, shade? Yeah. Besides the uh, little items that are listed here. Correct. Yeah, the awnings that are there now will remain no longer moving. So. All right. Councilor Creasy. Thanks, Mayor Christy. Uh, one of the biggest complaints that we had was because of the chain link fencing there. And I see that it's being replaced with, with black chain link fence. That was seen as that with the with the landscaping in front of it was going to be good enough. Uh, yeah, one of, yeah, one of the big comments that we heard was the plague or, or the spray park now kind of feels a little bit industrial um, with the galvanized chain link fence. Um, what we're proposing here and what's included in design is a vinyl coated black chain link fence. So similar like a black, um, a black netting would be on a hockey rink. The black just seems to disappear a little bit better than a white chain link fence or a galvanized chain link fence. And so uh, hopefully it won't be very noticeable with the uh, vegetation that we're also finding. All right, the motion is on the floor. Any further discussion? All those in favor? So carried. Thank you, Jordan. Have a great evening. And you did it with a minute to spare. All right. We will go to public hearings. We have a public hearing for uh, land use and planning and development by law 300.79 exchange amendment uh, group home in several district, districts. Uh, I now declare the public hearing open at 6.30 p.m. and the uh, hearing is held pursuant to section 7, 8, 
230, 606, and 609 of the Municipal Government Act 2000 as amended. And I would ask our legislative coordinator to confirm that the purpose, what the purpose of the public hearing is, that the statutory public hearing notice was advertised in the local newspaper and when, and that any written submissions received and not included in the public hearing agenda package are read into the record. Thank you, Mayor Christie. Um, the purpose of the public hearing is to consider bylaw 300.79, exchange amendment. The statutory public hearing notice was advertised in the Lacombe Globe on July 11th and July 18th, 2013, in accordance with section 606 of the MGA. Um, one written submission has been received to date. addressed to the Wall Creek Youth Unlimited from the Lacoma District Planning and Community Support Services and it reads, to whom it may concern, on behalf of Lacoma and District FCSS, I am pleased to write this letter of support for Wall Creek Youth Unlimited in their efforts to develop and implement the support of transitional youth housing program. Youth Unlimited does a fantastic job reaching out to youth in our community. Their on-the-ground approach and supportive network of leaders and community partners provide youth in the common area with a safe place to connect, feel supported, and offer opportunities to grow and succeed. At the Coleman District FCSS, we offer a community outreach program to support individuals and families who need assistance as a result of, their, of issues related to poverty, such as low income, homelessness, family, or relationship changes, and other basic needs. Our outreach coordinator has worked with many vulnerable youth who are, who are in need of a safe home and supports to help them through difficult challenges and family situations. We do not have any local youth housing supports and in most cases our only option is to refer these young people to a regular youth shelter. The evidence-based research conducted by Wolf Creek Youth Unlimited staff strongly supports the need for such a facility and program in our community. I can foresee many benefits to this innovative approach, which focuses on prevention and intervention, encompassing a holistic approach to help youth. Investing in our youth today so we can build a stronger future is critical. This is much needed service in our community, and we look forward to being a partner in this very important initiative. And it's signed Susan McDonald, Executive Director of the Colon and District FCSS. Thank you, Doreen. Uh, I would ask that all persons giving oral presentations uh, clearly state their name uh, for the minutes and the presentations are brief and to the point. Uh, I turn the floor over to Planner Kirchner. Thank you. Uh, the city has received an application for a tax change amendment which would create the use supportive residence and for this definition to be a discretionary use in the residential large lot single detached dwelling district R1A, residential medium lot single detached dwelling R1B, resident small, uh, smaller lot single detached dwelling R1C, general residential R2, and the medium density residential R4 district. This change is presented as bylaw 300.79. The application was made um, by Mulvey Hill Incorporated on behalf of the um, Wolf Creek Youth Unlimited um, for this tax change amendment. Administration has prepared this bylaw which would create the use supportive residence and for the definition to be added as a discretionary use. Supportive residence is being defined as a use within a detached, semi-detached or duplex dwelling with two or more accommodation units where residents are selected on the sole discretion of the operator. Mandatory placement of residents by governmental agencies or correctional services shall not occur. Support services offered on site are focused on guidance and counseling and do not include on site medical facilities. This type of use, while similar in nature to the adult care residence, will allow for supportive living for a variety of age groups, including youth, and will not focus on residents who need round the clock physical or medical care. 
It is also proposed that these will not have mandatory placement or be of an institutional focus. Staff is proposing to include supportive residents as discretionary use in R1A, R1B, R1C, R2, and R4 districts. The districts being proposed to have the supportive use um, allow for the type of housing styles deemed conducive. R1A, R1B, and R1C allow for the development of new detached dwellings as a permitted use. The R2 and R4 districts allow for the development of detached, semi-detached, and duplex dwellings as either permitted or discretionary uses. In addition, through the selective wording in the definition and the district choices, administration is limiting the type of use to smaller density homes, which will help limit the size of support residences and help maintain the residential nature of the use. It is felt that these housing types will limit any potential neighboring conflicts by ensuring a lower density and having the ability to accommodate a potential increased demand in parking. Staff is also proposing specific requirements that will help ensure that the supportive residents will meet the community standards of development. The conditions are as follows. The building must be of a residential architectural style, reflecting and complementing the residential development of the surrounding neighborhood. Two, supportive residences shall be contained within a dwelling unit and shall be subject to A, the landscaping requirements of the applicable dwelling unit in which the type of use is contained. B, the development regulations of the applicable zone for the dwelling type in which the use is contained. Three, the facility must have permanent staff living on site. The number of staff living on site and total number of staff working on site shall be outlined in the development permit application. Four, the development must include rules and regulations which all residents must voluntarily abide. A sum summary of the rules and regulations shall be provided and considered as part of the development permit application. And five, supportive residences shall not be clustered in any one area of the city. Consideration of similar developments location within an area will be at the discretion of the development authority. Uh, lastly, proposed parking re requirements will be calculated using the following information. Two uh, parking stalls for the dwelling unit, one stall per staff member not living on site, one stall per additional staff member living on site if the number of staff members living on the site exceeds two, and one stall per three guest beds. Um, it should be noted that um, each proposed development of a supportive residence will be site specific and will need to meet all the requirements of the land use bylaw, including landscaping, parking, design, and operational elements. Each proposed development will re be reviewed by the city's development officers with final decisions being made by the Municipal Planning Commission. Staff is recommending this addition of supportive residence, residence use and the subsequent tax change amendments, including design information, parking requirements, and making supportive residence discretionary in the R1A, R1B, R1C, R2, and R4 districts. Um, in this case, we do have an example which has triggered this tax change amendment, which is for Youth Unlimited who are looking to operate a supportive residence geared towards um, youth in the community who have found themselves without a stable housing environment. Um, this may be in, as an alternative to foster care or an unstable home environment and would uh, service um, young people aged from 16 to 22 approximately and would provide them with support and assistance needed to allow these young people to become full productive members of the community. Um, in this situation, they would have house parents living full time in the home, um, provide a peaceful, safe, and trusting environment for the residents. Youth workers would work one-on-one -on -one with the residents, helping them set goals for the future, heal past hurts, and discipline when required. Volunteers and community organizations would supply further support and assistance. The residents will also be enrolled in school and or have jobs within the community to help them gain skills for the future. And there will be a strict policy of no violence or drugs in the home. And they have su supplied supporting information for this. But I think um, I'd like to emphasize before we go further that um, this bylaw amendment is text change and it deals with this use over a large amount of area in the community and it should not be viewed as being uh, site specific because although this is an example of one, um, it is only one example and it would be dealt with um, by Municipal Planning Commission if this text change were to happen. 
Um, we did our public uh, notification in the Lacombe Globe, as well as posting on City of Lacombe website. And there is um, another letter of support in the attachments as well. And um, at this point, we have no other alternatives. And I'm okay. Thank you very much. I would ask if there's anybody here in favor of this amendment who would like to speak to come forward. And I would just ask that you speak your name for the minutes. You got next one. The floor is yours. Good evening. Thank you. My name is Shar Locker. I am with Wolf Creek Youth Unlimited. And I'm excited to be here in this process. This is an important bylaw change. As the population of at-risk youth increases within the city of Lacombe, it's important that together we recognize and acknowledge the needs of this vulnerable population. We know through hands-on experience, as well as through conversations with FCSS, the Outreach School, and Children Family Services, that there is indeed a large need for supportive living within the city of Lacombe. The problem uh, or the issue already exists here. By providing appropriate intervention and supportive housing to at-risk population, we will be able to impact not only the life of that particular individual, but the lives of their family members, their friends, and community members both today and into the future. The benefits of supportive youth housing is best measured by contrasting two potential outcomes. First, looking at at-risk youth who do not have at least one supportive healthy adult relationship, we know that they are statistically at risk for entering an unhealthy lifestyle. Many, if not most, will enter into a lifestyle involving either unplanned parenthood, criminal involvement, under or unemployment, addiction, abuse, violence, general poverty, and homelessness. By contrast, if as a community you can come alongside and equip these same young people, helping them develop the skills and supports that they need to pursue their full potential, the likely outcomes are healthy relationships, meaningful employment, broken cycles of family violence, abuse, and neglect post-secondary education, investment into the community rather than taking on the community, and freedom from substance abuse and addiction. We will also be able to reduce the strain on policing resources and create safer and more enjoyable neighborhoods, decrease the need for medical resources, increase the contribution of the individual into the community, and decrease the strain on children and family services for both now and generations to come. By creating space in our community for supportive youth housing, we're taking a proactive step towards addressing important issues and supporting the full potential of um, youth at risk in our city. And so thank you for considering this program. Thank you. Any questions? Council. Seeing that. Thank you. There is anyone opposed to the amendment? Who's here this evening would like to speak? I ask you to come forward now. Before I have you state your name for the minutes, there's a gray button on the front there of the mics. There you go. You can adjust that too. Thank you. Uh, I'm Marcel. I live in the area where we're talking about that they want to build this. Just behind it, there's a, a little park for young kids. And I've noticed a lot of others. It's a park that the uh, serves for a big community all around. And young mothers with their kids, they go there. And um, me, it's mostly to protect the park. We already have an environment right there for young families. And uh, I've noticed also that uh, from school that's on the, uh, the um, number 12th, the kids after school, they walk through there, teenagers, they stop there, and the minute they come through there, the moms and kids, they go away. And they'll stop, sit at the table, some of them will climb on, on, uh, on the uh, amusement park, or whatever you call it, on French. Anyway, uh, all I want to do is protect that park for that kid. There's already an environment there. I'm, I'm not against helping the teenagers, totally not. But why should we destroy one community that we already have to build another one? This one is already there. 
uh, it's, it's a nice place to live, it's comfortable. So I think if we're going to focus on helping young adults, let's focus on placing them, you know, where they can really run and play ball and whatever. It's mostly to protect that part. That's, that's my big concern. And then um, for the, I know they're going to have three parking, from what I understand. And I think it's going to take a lot of space around that uh, little corner that we got there, the community. So I, I've been talking to people <coughs> around. They all agree with what they say. They said they were going to be here. But the thing is, it's vacation time. A lot of people are gone. So that's mostly my concern. Let's not destroy what we have there to build something else over there. So I think young adults in school, we know that, the elementary school, the elementary kids are in one place and then the junior high in another place. So let's protect this, please. That's all I ask. Okay. And what was your last name, Marcel? Desjardins. Desjardins, thank you yeah. very much. And any questions for Marcel from Marcel? Seeing none, thank you. And is there any person deemed to be affected who wishes to speak? Oh, is there? Oh, well, I, would, he's, I just wanted to speak sort of what Mr. Marcel was saying. Okay. You say so you are deemed to be affected? Yes. <laughs> or, or are you opposed? I'm in favor of facility. I question the location of the space. Okay. Um, Should I go back and sit down? <laughs> I think in order, I'll ask if anybody else is here in in favor of it, and then we'll have okay. you come up. Right. Anybody else in favor that would like to speak to that? All right, we'll have you come forward now. And I'll have you state your name as well. And, uh, I'm Rocky. <laughs> My name is Beth Schloss. Okay, and what was the last name you did, Beth? Schloss. Okay. Um, I live about a block away from this proposed location, and I operate a day home. I understand the absolute necessity for facilities such as this, so I am not in any way saying don't put it in my area just because I don't like them. My concern is the use of that park. Um, I, of course, I have the day home. We frequent that park quite a bit, but there were occasions when I would load up the van and I would take kids over to the, the uh, park that's located behind the co-op mall by the ball diamonds. That became a teen hangout, and it became filthy and became unusable for us because it became a hangout. My concern is that when you place a facility right beside that park they're going to gather there and it's not just the kids who will be in that group home other their friends classmates will be drawn to that area as well and i'm really concerned that that will become their hangout and really affect our ability to use the park with our kids so i think would it not be um, better for the teens and young people themselves that the immediate facility that they're going to be next to is not one geared towards families and children in day homes. Would it not be make more sense to put them in an area where there's activities close by that are geared towards their age? Because so, I don't think any of them want to go swinging or merry <laughs> around. So, thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Having heard all those in the building here today, I will declare the public hearing for bylaw 300.79 closed at 6.49 p.m. And thank you for all those in attendance. We will move on to uh, public hearing for bylaw 300.80 land redesignation. I declare that public hearing open at 6.50 p.m. And this public hearing is held pursuant to section 7, 8, 230, 606, 692 of the Municipal Government Act 2000 as amended. And I would ask our legislative coordinator to confirm that the purpose of the public hearing is that the statutory public hearing notice was advertised in a local newspaper and what dates and that any written submissions received but not included in the public hearing agenda package are read for the record. Attorney? Thank you, Mayor Christine. Um, the purpose of the public hearing is to consider bylaw 30080, land redesignation. The statutory public hearing notice was advertised in the Lacombe 
Grove on July 11th and July 18th, 2015, in accordance with Section 606 of the MGA. No written submissions were received on it. Thank you very much. And once again, I would ask that uh, anybody given oral presentations would clearly state their names and be brief and to the point. I'll turn it over to Madam Kirchner. Thank you. The city has received an application for the redesignation of land described as part of Northwest 324026 West 4th from future designation district to residential smaller lot single detached dwellings district R1C and public and institutional use district P. Uh, this amendment is being presented as bylaw 300.80. The application was received from Saber Properties Limited for this rezoning. The rezoning will help facilitate the future development of Phase 1 of Trinity Crossing. These lands are contained within the Trinity Crossing Outline Plan, which was adopted and amend was amended in May 2013. Uh, administration has prepared this bylaw to rezone those properties. Um, the phase of the development will kiss, can be comprised of 27 residential smaller lot single detached dwelling parcels and two public and institutional P parcels. The second smaller P lot is a remnant parcel with the other portion of it having been dealt with in a previous subdivision. A subdivision application for this part, uh, phase of Trinity Crossing is, has been submitted and is being processed concurrently. The proposed rezoning meets the requirements of the Trinity Crossing Outline Plan as seen in Phase 1 of the proposed phasing map. Um, and there are copies of the rezoning map and uh, the Phase 1 um, section of the proposed phasing map from the Outline Plan for comparative purposes. They are attached in this document. Um, in conclusion, due to the consistency between the proposed rezoning and the Trinity Crossing Outline Plan, Administration is recommending the rezoning of part of Northwest 32, 4026 West.